All right, good evening, everybody. If I could uh, get everybody's attention. We're going to kick things off. So uh, first of all, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, really appreciate you coming out to our first kind of community conversation event. My name is Jonathan Reiner. I'm the Director of Planning and Development for the Town of Groton. Uh, our office put together this event with the help of some other uh, staff and some of our partners from around the town. And really, the main purpose of this event is to talk about and understand some of the topics that are impacting our daily lives in Groton. We're trying to engage with you, members of the community, in different ways, at different locations, not just at another meeting at Town Hall, but instead out in the community. And we want to hear from you, not only at this event, but also um, uh, I'll make a couple of plugs tonight for our Greater Groton webpage. If you haven't seen it already, please check it out. There's uh, some good interactive surveys and events that are on that. Um, before I go on a little more, I do want to just talk logistics a little bit. Um, there's emergency exits outside of this room on the left, or you could um, hear as well and also the door that you came in. Restrooms, uh, if you go out the door, take a right. They're right past the entrance on the right-hand side. There's also uh, some water coolers there. So generally tonight's agenda, uh, we're gonna have Dr. Don Poland speaking uh, in just a minute or two, and then we will um, break out into some breakout groups on three different topics for about 20 minutes, uh, around 6.30, 6.40, and then the last, say, 20, 30 minutes or so, we'll do some questions and answers. I did ask everybody when they signed in, if you don't have a blue note card, we're taking questions only on note cards. So if you wanna write your questions on a note card, at the end of the night, we'll collect all those and that way we can kind of get through the questions a little quicker, as well as some of those folks that don't feel comfortable always asking questions. We wanna just make it a neutral playing field so that we can get questions from everybody. Um, after, uh, also there's food outside. If you haven't had some, please help yourself to that. And tonight is, Don will talk a little bit, but we wanna hear from you and we want you to talk with each other about issues that are important to all of you in Groton. Um, so also, let me uh, give a little intro on Don. Don, Dr. Don Poland is a social and spatial scientist and a planner with over 30 years of experience in land use planning, economic development, housing, real estate, and community development. He has experience in the public, private, and nonprofit and academic sectors. He offers a unique approach to addressing the social, economic, spatial, governance, and policy challenges of creating and maintaining healthy, vibrant, and prosperous communities. Dr. Poland is accepted as an expert witness in the area of land use planning, neighborhood redevelopment, and um, community development in the United States District Court. He's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, a certified zoning enforcement officer, past president of the Connecticut chapter of the APA, and a fellow with the Connecticut Policy Institute. Don's a great professional, and I'm thrilled that he's agreed to be here tonight to lead this discussion. And I really, uh, thanks Don, and I'll hand it over to you if you wanna come on down. Um, and one uh, last plug for Greater Groton, and also when we break out into the small groups out in the room, we will be handing out little sticky dots for uh, a survey, because we always do a little sticky dot survey. So uh, with that, Don, thank you. Thank you, John, appreciate the introduction. Good evening, everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, so when John asked me to do a presentation tonight touching on topics like demographics and market and place, uh, my initial thought was I was going to take a look at a deep dive into Groton data. And then I realized you guys have so many good studies, plans, and data available on your webs on the planning department's website that I decided I wanted to kind of take a different take on this or a different approach to this. So, wow, it gets really bright with the white screen. Uh, <laughs> so, the topics I'm going to cover tonight are demographics, market dynamics, and types of place. The learning objectives ultimately are to unpack demographic and demographic trends and how they inform change, to explore market dynamics and self-organizing as self-organizing uh, complex systems, and to reimagine place as platforms, adaptive platforms of performance. And I'll talk about that more later. 
But what I realized is my real objective here is to try and get you to think more carefully and critically about data. We always see all this data, population's increasing, it's decreasing, this is going on, that's going on. And I wanna try and connect dots tonight. First, before I start talking about connecting dots, I wanna talk about change. Years ago, I was having lunch with an out-of-state developer who was proposing a project here in Connecticut. And he was, his project was being met with fierce opposition. And I had asked him the question, so, how's it going with uh, the NIMBY response to your development? And he looked at me and started laughing. He was like, NIMBYs? He's like, I can deal with NIMBYs. I've been doing this for 20 years. He's like, this isn't NIMBYs. I was like, then what is it? Oh, NIMBY's not in my backyard, just in case you don't know. Uh, I'm like, then what is it? He's like, fear of change. He's like, I've never experienced this before. Done work in dozen states, and the reaction here in Connecticut is fear of change. And that's something I'd already been thinking about. And it's something I've thought a lot more about since then. So understanding change, first and foremost, it's inevitable. Things change. You can't stop it. Uh, and in some ways, we need to get by it. Change is neither good or bad. We place our emotions onto change, but it has both desirable and undesirable outcomes. Uh, it can also produce opportunities and surprises. And the challenge is not to resist change, but to embrace it and manage it. Uh, and I spend a lot of time with communities that I work with figuring out ways of how do we embrace change and how do we manage change. So, resilience thinking. Embrace the simple notion that things change. They will never stay the same. Uh, recognize that Groton is always shifting and changing. Change is not continuous or gradual, but episodic. It's kind of funny, we tend to think it's continual. It f appears to be continual. But things slowly build in a certain direction, then something happens, and then a lot of change occurs. A good recent example of that is the COVID pandemic. We have been moving in the direction of remote work and hybrid work. People were becoming less and less tethered to their desk in an office space. And then COVID happened. And overnight, we all had to learn how to use Zoom meetings and be able to work remote. And then COVID, passes to whatever degree it's passed, but we come out of those lockdowns and they persisted long enough that now hybrid work and remote work have become, become commonplace. That's an episodic change. We were gradually heading there, but then boom, it happens. Uh, so the challenge is don't try and predict or preordain the future, something that I think we often do too much of in planning but to build capacities into a community to absorb and accommodate change. So now, demographics. Uh, two quotes on the left-hand side. The first one's by a gentleman by the name of Peter Francis. He was a demographer who founded a magazine called Demographic America. And Peter was famous for always saying, demographics are destiny. And that is by looking at your demographic data, you can kind of tell where your community is going. Second quote, I can't remember the author's name, and my book is up in Maine, far from me, so I couldn't double check it. Uh, but this recent author opened the book with a sentence that said, two thirds of everything can be explained by demographics. And tonight, I'm gonna explain two thirds of everything being explained by demographics. In the world of demographics, there's kind of two sides. Demographic research, looking at age, gender, you know, population, households. And then there's a whole nother side around what's called uh, psychographics or consumer segmentation. And that looks at more of the behavioral side of these things. My lecture tonight is going to exist at the intersection between these two because I think that's the most interesting place. So, I know these numbers are small for those of you in the back and so forth, but the chart over here in the middle, this is total population change between 2010 and 2020. Connecticut's at top and then Groton. 
you guys lost 4% of your population over that 10 year period of time. The state of Connecticut grew by only 1%. It's kind of an insignificant growth number. And New London County lost 2% of its population. So you've actually lost population at a greater rate uh, than actually all the counties in Connecticut uh, and the state itself. The top graphic here, uh, table here, is adult population. So that's 18 and older. The state grew by 4%, Groton declined by 1%, and the county grew by 1%. This is actually an interesting one. In most Connecticut communities, I see growth in the adult population. It's the next slide where I realized why I actually saw a decrease there, and I'll explain that when we get there. The bottom chart is your under 18 population, 17 and under. And in that chart, Connecticut lost 10% of its population over that 10 year period. The county lost, where am I? 13%, numbers are too small on my screen. And you guys lost 15% of your young persons. Just to confirm that, the table down here in the left, since 2007, you have lost 1,100 enrollments in your school district. Most of us get afraid of housing development because it's going to add more children. For most communities, we should be happy to be adding more children because statewide, we are losing young populations constantly. So why aren't you guys getting older in the context of that population data? These are population pyramids. They provide us the structure of your population. This is 2010. Male populations in blue on the left, female population in green on the right. And they're five-year cohorts, zero to four, five to nine, you know, 60 to 64, all the way up to 85 plus. And if you see, you guys have an inordinate amount of 20 to 30-year-old mostly males, but also a bit there on the female side. And that's the very reason we're standing here at the sub base. If you look at this dotted line outside, that is New London County projected over you guys. If you look at that, you will notice that it's wider up here in the 50 somethings and it's narrower down below. It's skewed a little bit by Groton in the sub base. Uh, but the fact is most communities in Connecticut are aging. They're adding old people. Uh, and the county is aging, but the sub base skews you guys. So this is 2023, you can still see that skew. And on the next one, we go to uh, projection out to 2028. For me, the interesting thing here is looking at a community and breaking it out into what are the generations. I have the red lines. Silent generation at the top, then the baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, going all the way down to the most recent Gen A, uh, Gen A population. And then also, I put this box here. And that box is working age population. So we can start looking at how much of your population's in the workforce versus how many older dependents do we have, people that are on things like Social Security, and younger dependents who are supported solely by their parents. And that can start telling us stuff about things like government services. So in general, uh, you guys are aging, which is a trend in Connecticut, and it's not necessarily the best trend, not because it means we're all getting old and gonna die soon, but there's economic ramifications that come with it. Older households spend less than younger households. So if a community's aging, there's less money more likely being spent within the community. So I wanna talk about some big national trends. So the number of parents with children under the age of 18 and living in the, uh, at home declined by three million nationwide since 2010 to 2020. That's amazing. Not just a trend here in Connecticut, but nationally, we're losing young people. There are 36.2 million one-person households, or 28% of our total population is single-person households. 
In 1960, only 13% of, 13 of households were single person. That is a tremendous shift in change. Then, 2020, 33% of adults had never been married. Compared to 1950, only 23% have never been married. The median age to marry for the first time for males is 30.5, for females is 28.1, up from 23.7 and 20.5 respectively in 1947. 58% of adults 18 to 24 live in their parental home, and we have the highest percentage of 18 to 34 year olds living with their parents since 1940. Our households have changed. The people that occupy them, the number of people that occupy them. This graphic here on the right the chart actually tracks from 1970 to 2012, single person households increasing in number, two person households increasing in number, and then households with three, four, five or more persons all contracting. So our households are getting smaller and smaller. This is my favorite slide. Uh, we'll start on the right-hand side. So households are getting smaller. What's going on there? You already heard kind of we're aging, we have fewer children. How does that play out in household structure or households by type? So the bottom graphic here, the bottom bar is on this chart. This category is married couples with children. In 1970, 40.3% of the population had uh, were married couples with children. In 2012, it was 19.6, cut in half. Today, today it's actually down to 19, it's still contracting. Married couples without children statistically stayed the same over that period of time. But then we see other family households increase, but most notably, men living alone and women living alone increase dramatically. The kids go away, and the single person households increase. That's the shift in change. I love popular culture. So situational comedy, kind of this chicken and egg thing. Is it mirroring what's going on or is it kind of leading what's going on? But go back to the 1950s and you've got Leave it to Beaver. Right, mom, dad, two kids, the nuclear family. 1970s, the Brady Bunch. We don't know if it's death or divorce that causes them to get together, but now you've got a six children household. I grew up in a neighborhood full of ch six children households in the 70s. Family ties, three kids in the 80s, and then something happens. Late 1980s, Seinfeld comes out. Single persons, no kids. 1994, friends, single persons, no kids. Then sex in the city. 1998, I think, no kids. And then most recently, a good example, the Big Bang Theory. Why? Because the contraction here. A bunch of married couples with kids wanted to watch families with kids. A bunch of single persons without kids aren't really interested in watching programs about married couples with kids. So we see these shifts changing. I just want to touch on one thing here, and it's really this idea of paying attention to slow-moving variables. I love Mary Tyler Moore, I love Dick Van Dyke, I love this show, and I always enjoy this photo, because it's a photo of a past time. Uh, it's not that long ago, though. Most of you were alive during this time, right? And we no longer see, or at least not in the same numbers, the kind of same domesticity. Women have re-entered the workforce. There's not as many of the stay-at-home moms. Uh, I like this living room, or it's interesting to me because there's no television in it. Kind of funny, a television program, but they don't have a TV in the room. Where now our houses are filled with multiple televisions. But things slowly change and we don't always pay attention to it. The most interesting thing here is a tabletop cigarette lighter in a container full of cigarettes. Because what did you do in the 1950s when you had guests? You offered them a smoke. How far we have come, how much we have changed. So 
rhetorical question here, but to get you guys thinking about your community, what does this mean? What does decreasing household size mean for Groton? Mean for housing, for retail space, for school enrollments? What does decreasing household types mean for how, uh, Huh. Oh, it was size in the first one. And then types shifting from married couples to single, single person households. What does that mean for your community? And we'll talk a bit more about that. Market dynamics. I'm always, cha I'm always asked by people, they say to me, well, what's the market? I'll answer that question in a little while. Uh, but when we're talking about markets, we have to talk about demand. And demand drivers, primarily for development and growth, are, are jobs. Connecticut's job growth has been stagnant since the 1980s. From 1985 to 1990, Connecticut added 103,000 jobs. The 30 years after that, 1990 to 2020, Connecticut added 45,000 jobs. Job growth has stagnated. Norwich, New London, uh, labor market has 128,000 jobs. This is your market. You can see the trend, you can see the drop off at COVID, you can see the growth here. And you guys do have meaningful job growth in recent years. And I think you'll continue to do so because of EB uh, in the submarine industry. So that's a positive. Uh, so what's market? What's the market? Market really is these pictures. I don't need to look at data to tell a market. Drop me in a community, let me see what types of businesses are there, what brands are there, and I can probably tell you pretty good what the market is, what the socioeconomics are. Some communities have Nordstrom's, most don't. Many communities have Target, many don't. And a lot of communities have Dollar General. Not as good as an example as it used to be because they've realized they can make money anywhere, even, multi, uh, even wealthy communities. But market is essentially what's there, what's being supported. So if we're talking about improving a community, then we have to talk about how do we change the market? How do we attract something different? So what type of coffee market is Groton? Quick, interactive. Whose favorite coffee is gas station coffee? Raise your hand. No one? All right. How about Duncan? How about Duncan? Whose favorite is Duncan? All right. Whose favorite is Starbucks? Who's snobby like me and only goes to Independence? A few there. OK. You often hear about the $5 Starbucks coffee. like. Starbucks convinced us to pay $5 for a cup of coffee. Uh, and to some extent, there's some truths in that statement, but it's really you know, disingenuous. Because if you look at, there's a difference between drip coffee, what you'd primarily get at Dunkin' Donuts, and espresso-based coffees. Espresso beans are higher quality, they're more expensive, and your drink is made to order. So it's labor intensive, and that's really where the additional costs come from. Uh, but it's a shift in our consumer behavior. We're actually willing to spend five bucks on a cup of coffee. Mine actually comes to $5.11. Do the math, five times 365, and it's ridiculous how much I spend on coffee in a year, right? Changes happened with other consumer products, though, too. You guys probably remember this. When I was a kid, ice cream was mom buying the gallon tub of hood for like $1.99. And there was only like three or four flavors. And then, you know, Ben and Jerry's comes along and other ice cream products. And now we pay $7.99 for a quart rather than a dollar for a gallon. But it's a better quality product. It provides more variety. And we as consumers like it. I can work beer and coffee into any lecture. <laughs> I can also work wine in, but we're not hitting wine tonight. Uh, historical numbers of active breweries in the US. We had a really strong tradition of independent breweries. Prohibition killed them, and then kind of the big four companies took over the market for a long period of time coming out of Prohibition. 
Funny thing, innovation happens in weird ways. And the Carter administration passed legislation that eliminated the restriction on brewing beer at home. It was left over from the Prohibition era. A gentleman out of Boston by the name of Jim Cook emerges in the late 80s with a product called Sam Adams, the first kind of microbrew since the Prohibition era. And it gains popularity. And then we see this whole explosion in the microbrew industry. I just want to point you in that direction of kind of, you know, you never know when these shifts or changes are going to occur. So here's another good change. Graphic on the left, food for, uh, consumed at home versus food consumed away from home. Red line, 1970. And you see they finally cross in around 2016. We now eat more food out of the house than we consume in the house. It's essentially groceries versus restaurants. This is why we want to watch slow variables of change. Look what happens to the restaurant industry from 1970 until 1917. 40-fold increase from $42 billion to $800 billion industry. Those household trends I told you about, the declining married couples with children, directly related to this. Mary Tyler Moore goes and gets a job in her next show. 1970s, equal rights, re-entry of women into the workforce, and the start to a change in household structure. A decrease, in, uh, more single, Women staying single longer, marrying later, we start having fewer kids. All these demographic shifts that lead to this declining married couples with children also drive this. My mom was a stay-at-home mom in the 70s. She cooked breakfast every morning, sent my sister, myself, and my father off to school and work with packed lunches, and dinner was on the table every evening. She doesn't do that anymore. Well, she wouldn't. She's a bit too old for that now. But she wouldn't necessarily do that in the same way today. And that's why we eat out more. That's why we eat in less. So you can start seeing how these demographics start relating to behaviors. So my last one, my last topic is place. I want to force you guys to kind of think of place as uh, platforms of performance. So when I say place, maybe we're talking about Mystic. Maybe we're talking about this sub base. Maybe we're talking about a town park, what have you. But we have in our minds like this place is what it is and it needs to be that and it needs to remain that. And when things change, we then get all upset and go, oh, this isn't good. But at the end of the day, place is kind of just a platform. So Shakespeare, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. I would argue that we, as a society, are merely players on the stage of community. And those communities constantly shift and change. The platform may stay the same, but how we interact with it changes. How many of you have been to a Whole Foods? I'm curious, okay. So this is a regular grocery store, like a stop and shop on the left, the layout. Registers up front, all the dry goods in the middle, the freezer stuff around the perimeters. And this is a Whole Foods. And all in all, it's the same. Registers up in front, bunch of dry goods in the middle, frozen goods there. But then circled by kind of all this fresh food produce stuff. And you can start to ask yourself, like, what do we do at Whole Foods? And if you ask someone, what's Whole Foods? They'll say a grocery store. And if you ask them what they do, they'll say grocery shopping. And I've done this research. I've interviewed dozens and dozens of people about their behaviors at Whole Foods. And they'll tell you they grocery shop. But then when you ask them, what do you buy there? The first thing they say is, well, I don't do my weekly grocery shopping there because it's whole paycheck. It's too expensive. I'm like, OK, so what do you buy there? Oh, I go in for the sushi, or I get this specialty, you know, oat-based product. 
you start realizing that people do specialty shopping there. And if you look at the front of the store, you then start to realize that their checkouts are different. Stop and Shop has 17 aisles of checkouts set up for full grocery carts. And Whole Foods only has two or three of those, and then the rest are these little mini checkouts. And if you look at Whole Foods when you enter, you have the little basket, you have the little tote behind, suitcase basket, you have the little miniature cart, and then you have the full-size grocery cart. We don't grocery shop at Whole Foods, we forage. Uh, it's a different activity, but it still looks like a grocery store. The platform's the same, but it's organized differently and we use it differently. And when you look at Whole Foods corporate documents, they explain, we try and transform food shopping from a chore into a dynamic experience. Who knew grocery shopping was a dynamic experience? With lively and inspirational atmospheres, emphasis on healthy eating. And then you look further. And then you look further at their, uh, at their documents, and they've segmented their clientele, their customers, into groups. The conscionables, they support social and environmental initiatives. The organics, organically grown food is what they want, pers personal health and safety. Foodies, uh, food as love or with love. And experientials, who want unique products and special occasion items you start realizing that Whole Foods really isn't a grocery store. And then you realize that the other grocery stores are adapting and changing. They start offering fresh made pizzas and pre-made pre meals. Oh, just a sidebar stat. 18% of Whole Foods business revenue comes from those pre-made meals where you go to the buffet and you get the meal and you take it home with you. 18% of their model. I guarantee you 10 years ago, Stop and Shop, they were lucky if that was half a percent of their model. So this arrives us at a place that hopefully when you discuss issues outside now, you'll think a little differently maybe about your community. Uh, but there's this English geographer, Nigel Thrift, Sir Nigel Thrift, who in one of his books says, what's being attempted is to consciously conjure up experience experiences, which can draw consumers to commodities by engaging their own passions and enthusiasms. I think this is a brilliant statement. Our economy has shifted to an experience economy. When I was a kid, my mom would take me to shoe town. I'd get to try on a bunch of pair of shoes. I'd get to stand up, maybe walk in circles. And then she'd pick out the ones that were affordable, not the ones I wanted. Uh, I'm not the shopper, I don't like shopping, but about 10 years ago, I went to Dick's Sporting Goods to buy some sneakers. And uh, there were kids running around. And oh, I don't have kids, me and them don't really get along. And I was very frustrated by these kids running around. I never got my sneakers, I just had to leave. I went back to Dick's like a week later to look at sneakers again. And while I was trying on the sneakers, I realized something. In the shoes section of Dick's, there's a running track. Kids try on their shoes and then run around. What I was experiencing was not children just running randomly amok, which I thought it was, but they were trying on their shoes on the little running track. That's the experience economy. We look for experiences now. We purchase experiences as much as we purchase products. So why is Disney successful? It provides an experience, not simply a product. And why is Main Street Disney so ex successful? Main Street America, right? It's clean, safe, vibrant, and aesthetically pleasing. I think those characteristics kind of have a truism to them or a universalism to them. So once again, ending with Groton. Ask yourself, how can Groton engage the passions and enthusiasms of residents, workers, and visitors? How do you connect in new ways uh, to these people? John's attempt tonight and other nights through various events like this. What is Groton's experience or experiences? Uh, 
what can you offer in the world of the experience economy? And is Groton clean, safe, vibrant, and aesthetically pleasing? And if not, how can you make it that way? These questions apply to every place, every space within Groton. Parks, shopping districts, senior centers, wherever it may be, you can think of them in this way. So with that, I will say thank you and turn it back over to John. All right, thank you very much, Don. So uh, thanks everybody for listening to that. So now we're gonna get into the interactive part. So if you wanna exit out of here, in the room that we, you all came in on, there's three different stations set up. There's a couple of boards, uh, we'll give you some sticky dots. There's one looking at uh, market dynamics. There's another station looking at demographics. And then there's another one looking at kind of sense or uh, sense of place. Pick whichever one you want to go to. Um, if one is overwhelmed with people, maybe check out another one or where you might want to talk with some of your members of your community about those, those items. So uh, we'll take about 20 minutes or so on those and then uh, we'll try to wrap it up in here with some questions and answers. Again, if you want questions tonight, write them on a note card. We're only taking questions on note cards so we can kind of get people in and out of here uh, relatively quickly. We said we'd end tonight around 7.15. So uh, write down a note card. We'll collect them uh, shortly and uh, thank you. So if you want to head out into the other room and go uh, hit up one of those three stations and feel free to grab some more food if you didn't already. What demographic category do unmarried but long-term couples living together fall into? Uh, that's a good question. Let me go back to the categories. Oh, there we are. So other non-family households, the top one there, uh, would be the category that they fall into. And you can see it's a growth category that goes from 1.7 to 6.1% of total households. All right, actually, this one might be a, a Don one because I think he's probably got this down more than me, but how does sales tax, explain how sales tax is used in Connecticut and if any goes to the local economy directly, how it has impact on local growth or does it? Wow, that's a tough question. Uh, one, I mean, sales tax does come back to the community in the form of the state budget and state funds two communities, so it may be coming back in education funding, it may be coming back in road dollars and so forth. At the end of the day, the vast majority of it, though, ends up in the general fund of the state. Uh, what was the last part of it, that question? Sorry. How does it impact on local growth, or does it? I'm not sure the sales tax has that much impact. Uh, definitely not community to community because we have a standard rate across the state. We don't allow local tax, local sales tax. Uh, and at the end of the day, when you look at the percent differences with neighboring states, you know, it's a half a point, it's a quarter point, it's maybe even one point. Uh, I'm not sure the sales tax is that meaningful in that context. I think other taxes play a bigger role. I think in Connecticut, and this is not me bashing the property tax. I, I actually like the property tax, but yeah, it's expensive. It is very expensive when you look at what we pay in property taxes. So I think that's a bigger impact on development in the economy at the local level. Also, we don't get tax back uh, currently from like hotels and hotel stays. So that's something I know there's been some talk about changing legislation on that, but other states do actually do that. Another question we had was, we keep hearing about the need for more affordable housing. What percentage does Groton already have? And what is the goal mandate? <clears throat> so uh, we could talk about this one for hours. One of our next talks is actually going to be about housing. So the state goal or mandate for afford the, the mandate for affordable housing is 10%. <clears throat> Groton has, it's either 22 or 23% of our year round housing stock is affordable. Now that number's a little loaded because included in that count is all of our Navy housing. Um, and when you start diving deeper into that, yes, we meet the state's 
mandate for affordable housing, but do we have enough housing? We have a, uh, a market analysis, a housing market study, and an affordable housing plan that are all up on our webpage. I would encourage people to look at it. They might not be entirely riveting documents to read, but they have some really good graphics that um, some of the data jumps out you pretty quick. And we just updated our housing market analysis. It was done by uh, an economic firm looking at housing data. And in Groton by 2030, to meet basic demand, we need around 6,400 new housing units. That does not include, you'll hear some of us talk sometimes about the fact that we have 27,000 jobs in Groton and about 82% of those people don't live here. They commute to Groton. That's not uh, taking into account getting all of those people. That's just meeting basic demand. Can I read one? Yeah. So this one is, I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna turn it into a definitive question. It has a question mark at the end, but not necessarily written as one. Uh, does lack of trust in local government stop forward movement? Oh, that, that, that's a tough question, because the, the simple answer is yes, it does. Uh, good, governance, good governance is important. Uh, the better governance is, the better government is, uh, the more confidence and predictability that's established, uh, and the more likely investment will flow into a community. Uh, that being said, I don't want the question to imply that government isn't good, whether it's just Groton or in general. Uh, but yeah, we always have to strive to provide good government and better government. Uh, so, yes. Do you have another good one? Yeah, I do. So, question, given the way experiences draw people to community, why not consider turning our closed school properties into community green spaces? Examples, dog parks, swim clubs, picnic areas. I actually like that idea. And not that I'm saying you should be turning your old school properties into green spaces. But what I like about that, if you're willing to do it without passing the whatever referendum with conditions that say it must remain a green space forever, then I think it's an interesting way to land bank land. If you don't have the use for the school, if the school needs to go away, then turning it into an act of green space is great with the understanding that you may be able to do something else with it in the future. And that was my statement about don't preordain the future. We do this thing like the only way we're gonna create green space is if we deed restrict it into perpetuity. Uh, why? <laughs> You don't know what the future is going to bring. So make it green space, utilize it, but realize it could be something else in the future. As I said, platforms constantly change. So, yeah. And I, I think we're somewhere around 100 acres away from having 30% of Groton as protected open space. So uh, another question, how much is self-fulfilling? Less enjoyable experiences lead to less patrons, leads to less funds, equals less enjoyable or reverse? Um, or is it just build it and they will come? I think sometimes people had to, we didn't have the levels of data that we have available to us now. So people will say, well, how do you know about spending patterns? How do you know about commuting patterns? there's a lot of really easily trackable information because of these things right here. The amount of information that is available because a cell phone demographic, uh, you know, swipes, you know, I think we've all talked about buying something with a friend uh, or had that conversation, then you open up your phone and then you have ads for that thing that you were just talking about buying and is, is that coincident? So there's a lot of good data out there. We know from our market studies, from our market analyses, what some of that need is, but there has to be, if you know the need exists and you ignore it, then are we kind of, some of what Don was talking about, ignoring that driver of change that's happening? I have a question. Uh, so I'm gonna paraphrase some of this, but why can't we offer incentives to build housing uh, neighborhoods, affordable housing, 
with creative planning. And then it goes on to say things like, don't build it all on the road, do it on kind of like curvy linear streets and so forth. I think there's a couple answers to this. Uh, one, you can offer incentives. I know often incentives can be a bad word in communities, but I'm a firm believer in uh, government has a couple ways, really only three ways of doing things. They can hit you with a stick, regulations or taxes to shape your behavior, you know, don't do it. The smoking tax or the alcohol tax is a good example, those sin taxes of stopping you from doing something. They can do public education and try and bring you along, public service announcements, you know, don't drink and drive. Uh, or they can incentivize you. They can provide what are typically tax incentives to give, get you to do something. And the fact is, in Connecticut, construction costs are high, returns on real estate development are marginal and tough, and incentives are often needed. So if you shift it to thinking about, we're not giving away taxes, but we're using those incentives to actually get the kind of development we want. If the town's coming to the table with a tax fixing agreement, then I think it puts it in a different realm of being able to say, this is the kind of development we want. So I encourage whoever asked this, participate in the housing program that's coming up uh, and further flesh out this idea. So let's see, uh, assume a community desire for local services. What assumptions for growth are underpinning these growth needs in terms of housing and economic development? What assumptions? Read, read that again. What assumptions for growth are underpinning these growth needs in, term of, in terms of housing and economic development? So what's, I think the question is, what's desiring, what's, what's driving uh, the growth needs? Well, um, we're located kind of close to, you know, Don spoke about a little bit before, uh, General Dynamics Electric Boat. Over the last few years, there has been a little bit of a shift in their employment base there. Um, to note my sarcasm, because it's been um, a generational change. Uh, a number of us were at a legislative breakfast this morning. Last year, EB hired 5,000 people between Groton and Quonset Point. This year, they're looking at hiring another 5,000 people between e, uh, Quonset Point and Groton. And that number has been going on for some period of time. They have contracts that are 25 years out that they know that they're gonna be doing this work for this level of employment. So we, very few communities can predict what their employment rates are gonna be even a couple of years in the future. We know with certainty what it's gonna be for the long term. And you know, with again, using that statistic of 82% of our workforce commutes here, I don't think most people like driving very far to get to work. So there's this, there's this desire, there's market economics. Read our housing market analysis. That'll give you the data and what's there driving behind it. I don't know if you want to add more to that. Yeah, I want to add to it just, there was a slide that I didn't use that I started off in here, but it talks about demand drivers and I just touched on them briefly. The primary demand driver for housing is jobs. If you add jobs, you add population. Secondary driver is population. If population is growing, then you will have additional households and therefore demand for housing. Additional households are called household formations, the third driver. Household formations are interesting though. It could be a new person coming into the state that got a job at EB. It could be the 22 year old leaving college with that engineering degree and going to work for EB. They've left their parents' house or their dorm and now they're a new household. Or it could be other things like a married couple getting divorced and one household becomes two households, right? You split that household in half. So you can have housing demand with no job growth and no population growth if your households are increasing. Kids leaving their parents' basements and divorces. And then if you go back to my statistic, in 1960, only 13% of households were single person. Today, 28% of households are single person. Let's just say that's double, 13 times 13 is 28. 
I know it's not, but let's just pretend. <laughs> and let's pretend there were five million single person households in 1960, right? Doubling that would be 10 million single person households. But we also know our population's grown over that time. So those 10 million households, those additional 5 million, the doubling, is probably actually about 14 million. Well, that's 9 million household formations just from the rise in single person households. So a bunch of demand has been driven just simply by that change in household structure. So all these things are going on simultaneously. And then for this region, you layer actual growth at EB after decades uh, onto it. And yeah, you're coming into a period of probably some real good housing demand. It, it, you know, and the, the part that Don explained is really important because that's something I think a lot of people have trouble grasping is why do we need more housing if our population is not changing? And it's just population, our household has changed. You know, it used to be, you know, 2.5 kids and a dog named Spot, and now it's there's a lot more single family, single person households, yet we still have a lot of single family housing that's built. Yes, we have a good amount of multifamily housing in the town, but when you look at what that demand is, it's for a different housing type. I actually did the math in Hartford on that. Uh, so Hartford's peak population was like 177,000 in 1950, and then it contracted by, I'm going back to earlier data, by 2000, it contracted down to 125,000, so let's say 50,000 persons. I went back and got like the 1960s person per household number, 3.6 or something. I backed out the 7,000 vacant housing units that were demolished uh, in the 1990s and then redid the calculation. And while everyone thinks Hartford's population declined from everyone fleeing to the suburbs, and they did, people moved out. But if everything was constant, and you just did the change in persons per household from 1950 to 2000, it almost identically matched the contraction in the population. It's the point of demographics answer two thirds of everything, that early quote. If you really start digging into the numbers, it all just pencils out, it makes sense. So uh, I think we'll do one or two more questions. It is uh, 7.15, but uh, another interesting one is, what would our growth, our housing, our tax need to be to accommodate a no growth approach? So what would we do if we just, what would our, our taxes need to be, our housing to stop growth? You got a good I, one for that? Tom? Yeah, I can't give you an exact number, but this is the whole thing. One is with growth does come costs. Right, and that's why there is this fear of growth. That's why I said embrace change. Uh, because we automatically assume if we add new households, we're gonna add new kids to the school system, right? And we're gonna add new tax accounts to the assessor's office and the collector's office. And we're gonna have to hire more firemen and policemen and all those things. So then we end up in this place, growth is bad. Uh, and we should not grow. In the world of economics, stagnation is decline. So I would rarely recommend that your, your plan be to flatline yourself. That's not necessarily a good thing. But here's the whole thing. At the end of the day, rising costs in government, I just looked at a school budget and their increases in enrollments, a rarity right now in Connecticut. But the year-over-year -year increases that I tracked across multiple budgets, 80% uh, of it was due to inflationary costs, meaning electricity rates going up, meaning contra contractual contracts for salaries. Only, tw yeah, insurance, all those things. Only 20% of it was actually related to the, the adding of enrollments into the system. So I think you A, have to, and I'm not talking about schools, I'm just talking about municipal government in general. A, you have to accept that the cost of doing business, the cost of being government is going up, just as the cost of everything else is going up over time. So it will increase. 
But if you're a growing community, that means you have demand, that means you have desirability, and that means that at the end of the day, the value of property should be rising. Remember, the mill rate is just a multiplier between the value of the grand list and the budget needed to provide the services. So the fact is you can have, if your grand list goes up 20%, you can absorb a 10% increase in the budget without changing the mill rate, right? Mill rate's most likely gonna go down. Don't use the mill rate as the metric. And really, my advice to many communities is evaluate your budget and your plans and growth strategies around quality of life. You know, do you want an improved Groton? What is that improved Groton going to be? And are you willing to fund those things you need to actually do it? West Hartford's a great community, expensive community. I lived there. I hated paying the taxes. They were awful uh, what we were paying. But the quality of service, the quality of community, everything you get in return, when you're writing the tax check, you're just like, yes, I know. I've bought into it. It's what I wanted. Uh, so I think we have to look at it differently than just this kind of no growth or we're going to pay more taxes. So. Yeah. And I think for a lot of years when people thought about growth and new development, they thought, all right, single family houses, single family houses bring more school age children and those toxic little children cost us a lot of money in tax dollars because they cost so much to educate. And, and you know, it's we need families to help our communities grow and be that next generation. Also, not all housing is alike. And I think many communities, when they think of housing, again, they think of that single family house with you know multiple bedrooms. And what we're seeing is that, and what you can see from this data is we don't necessarily need just more single family housing. We need more housing maybe with one bedroom or two bedrooms in different types and styles for a very changing population and very changing demographic. Actually, just think about it. Housing lags. Housing's built at a specific moment in time to meet the needs of the consumer of that time. Where is my, why can't I find it? I need my Brady Bunch. <laughs> Where's my schools? Oh, it was in the first section. There you go. My Brady Bunch. If you think about it, the last housing boom in Connecticut was in the 1980s. We built a ton of housing, about 30,000 units per year. Uh, we only built about 5,000 units per year in the 90s. We built about 10,000 units per year in the, in the early 2000s, and now we build around four to 5,000 units per year. We have a ton of housing stock, single family, three plus bedroom, that was built for Leave It to Beaver, the Brady Bunch, and Family Ties. And now they only make up 20% of the housing market, 19% of the housing market. We actually have an oversupply of large single family detached housing with lots of bedrooms because the consumer coming forward is different. In 2006, 20% of the housing units in Connecticut being built were multifamily. The rest were single family detached. Today, over kind of the past seven years, 47% of the new housing being built is multifamily, not single family. The markets kind of come into balance. We're adding a product that's needed to meet friends. You know, oh, I shouldn't have said Chandler. Monica, uh, Ross Monica, needs a Ross, house. Ross needs, <laughs> you know, a house not, yeah. Ross needs a house by himself. And that's where we ar we've arrived. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, if we got questions that, from you that we weren't, uh, didn't have time to get through, it is after the time. It's 7.22. We, promise we try to get out of here by 7.15. Um, we will try to get them posted up uh, on our Greater Groton platform, and we really appreciate everybody coming here tonight. We'll be cleaning up, sticking around for a few more minutes if you wanna uh, ask us a question or two, but uh, otherwise I thank everybody very much. We're having another one of these events um, on, what is it, March 27th-ish? Come on, anybody, <laughs> come on. All right, in, in late March, we're having another one of these events. Check out Greater Groton, and um, we'll, it, it'll be posted up on our Facebook page, Instagram, and all that good stuff. March 28th, thank you very much. All right, have a good night, everybody. Thank you.